Members have the opportunity to pay more than a dollar, which gets their name entered in a drawing to win a date with a shenanigan. And that shenanigan is the winner's choice. The result of this date raffle will be revealed at the end of the 10 p.m. show on February 24th. For more information about this and other upcoming shows, visit at Lee Shenanigans on Instagram. Attention spring graduation applicants. Friday is the due date for transfer grades to be posted and incomplete grades to be removed. If you're planning to graduate in May, make sure you meet this deadline. On Friday, the baseball team plays Valdosta State University at home at 3 p.m. at the Larry Carpenter Field, located directly across the street from the Raycon Sports Complex. The baseball team has done well this season and are looking to keep improving. This is their first in-conference game of the season, so make sure to come on out Friday to support the team. Have an interview coming up? The Center for Calling and Career continues their senior series with a workshop focused on how to improve your interviews. This is a great opportunity for all students looking to stand out for a job, internship, or desired position. The event will be held this Thursday afternoon from 4 to 5 p.m. in Humanities Room 103. Remember when the snow canceled our MLK Day activities? The new schedule of events has been released. Events will take place for the rest of the month. Look out for the schedule on the Lee Clarion website on Lee Events and the Racial and Ethnic Relations Office Instagram at Lee U Racial Ethnic. Thanks for watching. Once again, I'm Anthony Cox. I'm Haley Holden, and you've just been updated. Good morning, Lee University. Let's stand as we worship together.
we thank you that we're able to come in here and lift our hands and magnify the name that is above every name. God, we ask that you would use this time, Lord, that you would touch Dr. Khan, Lord, to give him the words to speak to the student body. God, we'll magnify your name in all that we do, and we'll be careful to give you all the praise and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys may be seated. Good morning, everyone. Good to see you in Con Center Chapel today. We are starting a new series, the next five services. We're going to focus on what we're calling Keystone Scriptures here at Lee University. On Thursday, Dr. Cross will be speaking on Ephesians 2.10. Following him will be Dr. Walker on Ephesians 3.16-19. Then Dr. Justin Walker will be speaking on Psalm 19.17. And wrapping up, wrapping up the series will be Dr. Lorinda Roberts speaking on Psalm 90.17. But this morning to give us a glimpse and an overview of why these four passages are so important to Lee University. We are honored to have our chancellor, Dr. Paul Kahn, coming this morning. Will you welcome him as he speaks this morning? Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Moffitt. I'm pleased to be here today and to do this kind of peculiar uh, assignment, which is to sort of tee this series up for the four uh, people who will be preaching the chapel service is the next, the next four chapels. And so when Dr. Moffitt told me about this idea, I thought, that's such a good idea. I wonder why we never thought of that before. And, uh, Dr. Moffitt has lots of good ideas, but this is one of his best ones. And uh, I really have enjoyed kind of looking back over this. He said, you know, what, what, what we really want is not a sermon because these guys are going to preach sermons. These four people are coming. But he has identified these four keystone scriptures. So he says, kind of like a combination history lesson and talk about the scriptures and, and introduce the whole set. So that's what I'm going to do for, for the next few minutes. Four keystone scriptures. Uh, this university is built on Scripture. As a matter of fact, if you look at the college seal, you'll see that uh, 
the Bible is right in the middle of the college seal, a very simple college seal. An open Bible is there in the middle of the college seal. And the people who developed this seal long, long ago, long before I came along, did that obviously to indicate that the scripture, the Bible, is at the heart, it's at the center of what we do here at Lee. And we've followed up that kind of symbolism all across campus. And one thing I would hope that I could encourage you to do this morning is kind of open your eyes and look. You know, you can walk around a place for years. I do it all the time and, and not really see what's in front of you. And uh, it's because there, there is religious symbolism and symbolism that indicates our deepest values that are, that are all around the uh, campus. An example would be the chapel the chapel with no name, the stone chapel, as students sometimes call it. And I, many of you have noticed this, of course, because it's a very traditional type of chapel architecture. But I, I had them go up in the drone and take a picture of it from above so it's so clear that that chapel is in the shape of the cross. And many people come to the chapel and they leave and they don't really think about that, but that it's embedded in our consciousness that the cross as the in, in old Gothic architecture and neo Gothic architecture chapels, where the long uh, shaft of the chapel and the transepts are all to uh, approximate the shape of a cross. I don't know if you've ever noticed. If you ever go over in the School of Theology and Ministry and go upstairs in that reading room, or if you're just driving by from outside, there are 12 panels around that reading room. You see it very clearly from inside and out if you stop and count those. That was done intentionally to, to indicate the many uses of the, of the number 12, the 12 apostles, the 12 tribes of Israel, as we put it into that, that particular building. And you know, I'm kind of a sentimentalist and an, uh, I'm kind of a romantic in a certain sense. And, and I, I personally enjoy and am inspired by and warmed by these ways in which we remind ourselves uh, what we're all about and what we're doing here. So I, I did a, something that I, I don't know if I've ever t t told you that I did this or not, but it, it sounds kind of weird, but just go with me on this. When we were building the chapel in the year 2011, we built all kinds of buildings around campus. I want it to be totally different. So, you know, we love red brick and white columns and portico roofs and almost every building we built is some variation on that theme. So I said, let's make this chapel totally different. Let's make it out of, that's Texas limestone that this, uh, that's, uh, is used for the building of that chapel. And as we started to build the chapel, there was a guy who was a job superintendent over there. He was an older guy, and he was near the end of his career, and his name was Rick Fogwell. And I, I know Rick wouldn't mind my telling this story, although I haven't seen him in many years. But Rick was a rough old guy in the construction industry who didn't know the Lord until about two or three years before he came to, to work to help build some of the buildings on our campus. It was not an employee of Ali, he was an employee of the general contractor. He was the job superintendent. And I had worked with Rick on other jobs, big jobs. Uh, Battle O'Bannon, I remember, was one of his most difficult and most uh, uh, striking buildings. But when we decided to build this chapel and and they assigned Rick to be the job superintendent. He said to me one day out there, when we were just digging it out, before we had ever poured any concrete or, or created any superstructure, he said, uh, you know, Dr. Khan, I've got to tell you, this means something to me. I've built, all, I've built houses, I've built buildings, I've built strip malls, I've built motels, but I've never built a, a church before. And, I just, and then he kind of gave me his testimony. I didn't know much about him. He, he, he got very emotional and told about how he had given his heart to the Lord. and He had grown up in the Baptist church but gotten away from the Lord. He gave his heart to the Lord and was a, a wonderful Baptist believer. And he said, I just got to tell you, this means something more to me. This is special to me, building this church. And so we shared that as we went along. You know, my office was right over here, and I was over running across the street back and forth to the job site. I'm kind of obsessive about this kind of stuff. And so, you know, Rick Fogwell became my best friend when we were working on a project and We'd sometimes talk about the spiritual meaning. We'd stand over there, and when that was just a shell, the walls weren't even up, the roof wasn't even on, and we'd talk about how we hope this will be a place where students will seek God and find God, be found by God. And, and as we talked about that, 
we had an idea. I think, I don't know if it's my idea or Rick's idea, but the two of us together, you know, two people can have even crazier ideas jointly than a single individual is capable of. So we came up with this idea. We said we were pouring the concrete for the floor of the sanctuary over there. I said, why don't we put a Bible in the floor? Sounded like a good idea at the time. And I got a Bible, and it's one of the Bibles, like the Bibles we give away for commencement. You guys, I hope, are going to hang around to commencement. Some of you, that's not so far. Some of you, it's a long, you know, six, seven years. But you'll, you'll commence one of these days. And <laughs> at graduation, we'll give you a Bible like this. I'll say more about this Bible later on. But we got one of these Bibles that we had over in my office of the type we gave to seniors and kind of wrapped it in, in plastic and went over there while they were pouring the concrete of the floor of the chapel. And we got down and we put the Bible in the floor right where you walk in the door. Now remember this, next time you go into chapel, when you walk through those doors into that chapel down that center aisle, you're stepping right over God's Word. Yeah, I know, it's kind of corny, but you know what? It meant something to me, and it still means something to me. And we then all the hard hats, we said, just step back for a minute, guys. Take, take five minutes. We want to do this thing. And we... Got down and we knelt on that floor and we put this Bible in the floor and we prayed a prayer. We didn't sing a song because neither one of us sing very well. We didn't want to you know, scare the children or stop the traffic going by on Okoy Street out there. It's a little indication of the degree to which we know that God's Word is the core, the bottom, the foundation of this place. And this is what this series, these next four weeks, will, will seek to emphasize it's why we have an Old Testament and a New Testament course in every student's curriculum. This school was built to create, or, or, or was built in creating an understanding that God's Word under, undergirds everything. So whether you're studying to be uh, a physician or a school teacher or a businesswoman, whether you're interested in your major as languages or somewhere in the humanities or the sciences, wherever it is, under all of that is God's Word. All, it is God's revealed truth to us. So let me talk about these four scriptures that have been chosen. And interestingly, two of them are from the Old Testament. Two of them are from the New Testament. You'll be hearing about in the next four weeks. The two from the New Testament are both from the book of Hebrews. The two from the Old Testament are both from the book of Psalms. And as I thought about these as a package, which I had never really done before until Dr. Moffitt gave me this assignment, you know, three of the four are prayers. And one is not a prayer, it's kind of a proclamation. So let me talk about these four. Okay. First, Ephesians 3, 16 to 19 is one of the most famous prayers in Scripture. If you go over there in the chapel, when, you're, when you come down to the chapel and you look ahead, up, up past the choir, and you'll see a window, and in that window, you'll see this scripture verse. It's the most prominent stained glass window in the chapel, Ephesians 3, 16, 19. And as a matter of fact, the two other scriptures that I'm going to talk about are in the other two windows uh, in each transept. This Ephesians 3, 16, 19 appears there and in other places on our campus. Here's what it says. Here's what Ephesians 3, 16, 19 says. I pray, now we've elided some of those to make it uh, easier to get on the PowerPoint. And I'm sure when you hear the sermon on this, you'll get the whole load. But here's what the Apostle Paul prayed for his spiritual sons and daughters. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. And I pray that you may have power. Now listen to this to grasp, power to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of the fullness of God. What an amazing scripture. As a matter of fact, there's a contradiction, almost, a, almost an oxymoron in there when he says, I, I pray that you'll You'll know this love that cannot be known, that surpasses knowledge. And he uses this very strange verb, to grasp. Not just to understand, not just to know, not even just to experience. What does he mean, to grasp how high and wide and long and deep 
is the love of God. Okay, so let me tell you the story that how this all got started in 1986, 30, what, eight years ago. I was in my first year as president. We didn't have a ped mall in those days, so I was walking down the street over there toward the dining hall. That's when it was still a city street. But I remember students stopping me as I was crossing the street, and my recollection is that he was a freshman, although I could be wrong about this. It could be just my stereotypical view of freshman because he asked me a question that I didn't have an answer to, which is a kind of a freshman kind of thing to do. He said, Dr. John, do you believe, you believe everything in the Bible? Well, that's not a hard question. I said, sure, of course I believe everything. Is there anything in the Bible you do not believe, he said. I said, no, nothing. I said, well, then here was his good, here was his good question. He said, what in the Bible do you have the most difficulty believing? If there was going to be something you just didn't believe, what would it be? What is there in the Bible you have the most problem believing? And I said to him, as every smart professor should do to a smart freshman, I need to think about that. That's a good question. Always start when you don't know what to say. You've, you, I mean, there are not very many faculty here today, so I can be open about, you know, you, when you don't know quite what to say, you always start by saying, well, that's a really good question. I'm glad you asked that question. Meanwhile, the wheels are turning. You're trying to come up with an answer. I said, that's a good question. I'm glad you asked that question, but I'll tell you what, I haven't th really thought about it that way, but if you ask me again in a few days, I'll have an answer for you. Knowing that he was a freshman, had a short attention span, and would probably just disappear from my life, Right? But when I left and went back to my office, actually, I thought, that's a really very good question. What, what is it that I have the most trouble believing? And I knew almost immediately what the answer was. It wasn't the parting of the Red Sea, as wild as that seems. It wasn't manna on the ground every morning. It wasn't the walls of Jericho falling down. It wasn't the earth being spoken into existence by God in the first, in the first of Genesis. What is it? In, it's not, it, none of these miracles I have trouble believing. Honestly, I'm kind of have an old-fashioned literalist view of mir miracles, and I think it's just easy for me to just believe they actually happened and to believe in the factuality as well as the truth of Miracles, so I haven't really strained at that, but there is something in Scripture that I have trouble believing, and truth be known, I still struggle with believing it. And it's this, that I individually, just the way I am, with all my warts and flaws and hang-ups and insecurities, and failures and temptations and sins, preoccupation with self, I, just the way I am, am the object of the direct, immediate, personal, literal, emotional, unremitting, passionate love of God through Jesus Christ. Now, to me, just saying that right now, it seems like it's just almost impossible. I have to, I have to just trust it because it's hard to believe. And, you know, interestingly, this kid came back up to me on campus. I think the next time he saw me was in the dining hall. He did not forget this question. And he came up to me in a few days and said, well, Dr. Khan, do you have the answer to my question? And I recognized him and said, yeah, actually, I do have the answer. What's the, most, what's the hardest thing in the world to believe? I said, well, it's actually a miracle. There's one miracle that I have trouble believing. So, okay, he wants to play. I'll play. You know, he's thinking, well, you, what is it? Is, it? is it like Daniel in the lion's den? That's pretty far out there. He didn't say any of that. He, I said, I said I got, there's a miracle I can hardly believe is true, but I just believe it by pure faith. And he said, what it, what's the miracle? And I said, the miracle that I am right now standing in a, if you will, figuratively, in a cone of light coming down from God. A, a, a direct, immediate, specific, personal love of God for me. I have trouble believing that. And I think that's the thing in Scripture that I most have to just claim and accept and embrace by faith because it seems so beyond the imagination.
And in this scripture verse where Paul prayed for his spiritual sons and daughters, I got a feeling Paul struggled with it too. Yes, the great apostle Paul, I have a feeling he struggled with it too. I, knew, I know some of the greatest men and women in scripture, the great heroes of the faith, struggled with it. Not just in Bible times, but right up to contemporary times, they struggle with it. Unless you're some out of control egomaniac, unless you have perfected narcissism, if you stop and think about this, it'll just about take your breath away. And that's what this scripture is all about. That's how it speaks to me. Paul said to his spiritual sons and daughters, I wish, I, I'm praying that you'll have the power to do something. Now, the power to do what? Win the lost at any cost? No. Evangelize the world? No. Pay about a tithe? No. Live above sin? No. That's not what he, all these things he wants for them. I, I pray that you'll speak in tongues at every opportunity. No, that wasn't it. I pray that you'll, you'll be kind to everyone in your environment. No, that, all those things he would wish for and pray for his spiritual sons and daughters. But this is kind of the ultimate prayer to me. He says, and, and, and this scripture just throbs with emotion. Passion just comes pouring out of it. Think of these words, how, how, how amazing they are, how over the top they are. This is the Apostle Paul writing to his spiritual sons and daughters under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, and he uses such hot language. He said, I pray that you may have the power to grasp, embrace, suck it in, own it, believe it, feel it, know it. I pray that you may have the power to grasp and listen to the highly literate, intellectual Apostle Paul talk now, how high and wide God, it's like he just can't quite say it. He can't get it. That's how it feels to me anyway. And he says, and for you to know this love, which of course surpassed his knowledge, that's my prayer for you. And as I walked around that campus after thinking about this and I was headed toward my first Commencement in 1987, I feel like those students, like all of you, are my spiritual sons and daughters. I think God has given you, has given you to me to love as spiritual sons and daughters. And so it's a very obvious question. Well, you know what? What would I wish for you? If I could pray one prayer, one prayer, if I could pray it right now on this stage, if I could put your name on it and know that prayer would be answered. Wow. What would I pray for you? Well, there's so many things I pray for you. I wish for you good health. Good health, my goodness. I want you to stay alive. I want you to be safe. I want you to drive safely. I don't want you to be touched by some kind of illness, good health, friendship. I want you to have friends and be a friend. I want you to make good grades, of course, because this is a school after all. And if you go to come to a school and make lousy grades, there's something fundamentally wrong somewhere. There's a disconnect somewhere. So I, yeah, I want, you to, I want you to have enough money to pay for your needs. Sure. What do I want for you? I want all these things for you. I want happiness, whatever that is. I want you to be happy. I want all these things for you. But that's not what Paul prayed for us as spiritual sons and daughters. Or you say, okay, you're over into material stuff. And what about spiritual stuff? Well, I could pray all kinds of things for you spiritually that you would find your calling, of course. It's one of our, my primary themes here, that you would resist temptation, that you would come to chapel I'm not talking to you because you're in chapel, of course. I, I, I get that. I'm talking to all of you out there not in chapel. <laughs> I would pray that you would come to chapel. I pray that you would find pleasure and joy and freedom in worship. I would pray that you would understand the scripture. I would pray that you would win others to Christ. But the apostle Paul prayed the ultimate prayer because if this happens, everything else will somehow work itself out. He said, I, I pray for you that you may have the power to just grasp how much God loves you. And not just how much, but how. And not just to know it up here, but to feel it in here. Because the Apostle Paul knew it's a lot easier to, quote, unquote, love God 
than it is to feel loved by God. We would all say we love God, yeah, like we love the Braves, you know, like we love Duke basketball, like we love ice cream on a hot day. But that's not what he's talking about here. The Braves and Duke and ice cream does not love you. It's a one-way love. He says, if you, he doesn't say that, he says, I want you to feel, no grasp how deeply loved you are. It's okay, here, I gotta go. Now they've warned me, see, see, I'm going on too long. Jeez, even though they told me we could extend chapel time to 12 o'clock today. That's what you told me, wasn't it, Dr. Moffitt? Still, I wanna beat you to the lunch line, so I'll go on. So that first commencement, here's what we did. First commencement, we bought a bunch of Bibles. We had 160 graduates the first year I was president. All year, we had two commencements, 160 graduates. The last few years, 1,000 graduates every year. So I bought 160 Bibles with somebody else's money, of course. That's what college presidents do. <laughs> and I signed that Bible to every graduate. We embossed the name. This is an original Bible. You know what it is? Some kid did not, some not, not a kid, a guest did not pick this Bible up and we put it up in our office, and he never showed up, and so it's still there 37 years later. <clears throat> and I wrote the name of every student, embossed it on the front, named, wrote it at the top of the page, put the date, and put this scripture verse, this scripture reference. Ephesians 3, 16 to 19, and over the next 34 years, 21,000 students graduated from Lee, and I personally signed every one of those Bibles and put the scripture in there. Why would you put the same scripture verse in those Bibles? And then Dr. Walker's been doing that for the last four years, and this is a picture of one of the Bibles from last year's where Dr. Walker and I are both signing it now. Now, you see down at the bottom, Ephesians 3, 16 to 19. That's because that, we want that to be our last word to you. When you walk out the door with your Bible on the night before commence, commencement, it's going to say Ephesians 3, 16 and 19 until God tells Dr. Walker to change the scripture verse. Because we think it is the foundation of a life for God. Okay. Second. Okay, now look. Don't, don't get alarmed. That, that only took me basically about 15 minutes, and there's only four of them. Second, what's the second verse? Ephesians 2.10. Here's another chapel window, Ephesians 2.10. And what does Ephesians 2.10 say? It says, for you are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. This scripture became an important part of the life of Lee about 22, 23 years ago, about 2002 and 2003. When all of us on the faculty and the staff and administration tried to focus on what was our really, what were we doing here most? And we tried to focus on vocation and calling. Many things were done during that time to focus on vocation. The key word of this is the Greek word poema. Now, I'm not a theologian. I'm, God's allowed me to move through life without that burden, but uh, well, you're going to hear from two great theologians. We want an Old Testament guy and one a New Testament guy, and so they'll sort poema out if I get it wrong. Uh, poema is a Greek word that means a piece of work, a created thing, craftsmanship, workmanship, and it gets translated different ways in the different translations of the New Testament. Some call it workmanship. Some call it masterpiece. But the word means this is a thing God has created in you, out of you. As a matter of fact, it's the same Greek word from which the word poem comes. Poem, a poem comes. Poem is that thing that's created and, and uh, made frequently beautiful. It's the object of the creative energy and effort of the master. So we did many things. The Center for Calling Career, which is currently on our campus, was established at that time. Our Office of Grants went out and with help from other people got a $2 million grant from the Lilly Endowment and they funded this massive campus-wide effort to focus on calling. 
Dr. Cross is going to be speaking, I think, on this scripture, aren't you? Isn't this? Dr. Cross wrote a book on the on calling in the spirit, what, what it means to be called, what it means to respond to God's call, especially from our, our perspective of Pentecostal faith and worship. Capstone courses were created at that time to talk about poema. Scholarship, some of you, I, I would hope, somebody in the school of religion it, it gets scholarships called poema scholarships. They were funded by this particular grant. The whole point of this scripture is He's the artist, we're the artwork. He's invested in us, and when Dr. Cross talks about it, he'll explain more what all that means. But one thing it means is we are, we're unique, you know. We're not, the, we're not the widgets being kicked off the assembly line. We're individually crafted by God. Next time you go in Dixon Center, look up on the wall, and, and you may have never noticed this big, beautiful uh, well, hang, a thing hanging on the wall. I don't know what it's called. It's not a tapestry exactly, but a wall hanging. And it's created, as many on our campuses are by, on our campus, are by a Chattanooga artist named Doreen Kellogg, who's very gifted at this. And this thing on the wall has this scripture, Ephesians 2.10, for you are God's workmanship. We are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which he's prepared in advance to you. So there is that good work for you created in God's mind, heart, and his love for us. A third scripture, then we go to some scriptures from the Psalms. Psalm 90, 17. This also goes back in a way to 1986 or more particularly about 1989, 99. You'll notice that this appears, it appears on the chapel window, but this appears on all the cornerstones. We have a picture of a cornerstone up there. It appears on all the cornerstones. 19, so here's what you have. You have the date the building was built, and under it, Psalm 9, 9017. Now, here's a little bit of the story that's never told. That 1992, I think that's on Dixon Center, isn't it? Dixon Center or on the Watkins building. Both of those were built in 1992. If you had taken a picture of yourself by that in 1992, it did not say 1992 Psalm 9017. You know what it said? 1992 Paul Kahn President. As every other cornerstone on our campus said. So there's a story there. I was asked to make a speech one time to a group of Christian college presidents, and they asked me to speak on the mo worst mistakes I ever made as president. It was such a long list. It was such a long speech. I never got invited back. But this, this was mistake number one. So let me tell you how it all happened. When I was a little boy, I went to the North Cleveland Church of God right up here, and it was an old brick church. And in a corner, as a little boy, I remember playing around outside the church, and there was a cornerstone, just like we have in all of our buildings, there was a cornerstone. And here's what it said. We have a picture of that. A cornerstone. There you go. No, go on down. Don't go one more. I'm skipping. There you go. Now, this is a crude drawing, of course, because the building no longer exists, and presumably the cornerstone doesn't either. But here's what it said. Just like our cornerstones on our building, it said, 1939, D.B. Yao, pastor. I remember admiring that when I was a little boy. I was just a kid. I was five, six, seven, eight years old. I remember seeing that playing around, thinking, that's pretty cool. And I asked my mother one time, what is that? Who is D.B. Yao? And she said, well, honey, he was the pastor of the church who built this building. And I thought, that is really something pretty cool. That kind of stuck in my mind. When I came to be president of Lee, I became president of Lee in, 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 overnight, literally overnight. I went to a church conference, what we call the General Assembly. I was the vice president. While we were there, the president, Lamar Vest, resigned to take another position, and a board came into town and elected me president. I wasn't a, before that, I hadn't been a dean or anything. I, I was just a teacher. I taught psychology. I've been doing it for 15 years. I was totally, my wife and I, we were totally kind of shocked by all this, stunned. I literally left here expecting to come back and teach psychology the next year. And when I came back three days later, I was president. We were reeling. 
So we went up to a place in the mountains in North Georgia where they have a nice deck and a place to look out over the mountains. And we went up there for two or three days to just think and pray and look out over the mountains and try to figure what in the world has just happened in our lives. We're excited, we're thrilled, we're scared, we're shocked, we don't know what to do next. But I was the third, I was the fourth president in five years. Think about it. I was the fourth president in five years. And when I got up to chapel for the first chapel that fall, I was the fourth different president who had made that first chapel speech in the last four, five years, four presidents. I knew how impermanent a presidency could be. And I had a very strong sense of personal insecurity. And Darlie and I went up into the mountains and we were just going to think and pray. And I was sitting out on that deck looking out over that mountain. And Darlie came out to me with a cup of coffee and she said, Paul, I think, I think God gave me a scripture for us. Okay. I'm eager to hear this. She said, it's Psalm 9017, and it's, it says, it's a prayer, and the prayer is, Lord, give us your favor and make permanent the work of our hands. And she said, this is just going to totally tear our lives up, and it did. But if we're going to do this, I don't want it to just be one of these, you know, blips on the screen. I want God to do, use us for something permanent. And I know that's what you, and we prayed and we held hands and we did all those corny things that Christians do when they're emotionally connected to what's going on in their lives. This rendering in the King James, or most rendering says, give us your favor and establish the work of our hands. One of, the, one of the translations, only one that we found that we particularly like, says, and make permanent the work of our hands. When we got started as president, we had another one of those tapestries made by Dor Doreen Kellogg, and it hangs in my office right now that has this scripture. Lord, give us your favor and establish the work of our hands. And then we got started working. That's the one that hangs there. And it says, establish. Okay. All right, good things happened. We worked our tails off. The Lord blessed us. A lot of people worked really hard around us, and good things started to happen. And then finally, we built the first building. Now, we'd, we'd done the Ped Mall, knocked down the street, and built a tennis center, and those sort of things. But the first really major, serious building was Sharp Davis Hall. And it was 1989, and when they were building Sharp Davis Hall, I said, you know, I, I, it was so cool. And, and at the North Cleveland Church of God, you know, it had a cornerstone, said D.B. Al Pastor. So make a cornerstone and make it, say, 1989, Paul Kahn president. And they did. They put it in there. And we all shouted hallelujah and dedicated the dog out of that building. We celebrated. We did everything you can think of. And we loved it. Well, that was fine. But then what happened was we built more buildings. And as a matter of fact, in the next 10 years, 10 more buildings. <laughs> and every time they put Paul Kahn president on those buildings, and I didn't think much about it. And then one of these mornings, okay, don't judge me. Early in the morning, I, I would frequently run through campus doing my running. Still do it, only I walk now. And I start running past these buildings and the cornerstones all say, Paul Kahn president. And okay, I don't say this very often. I feel like I was rebuked by the Holy Spirit. <laughs> now, I don't use that kind of vocabulary very often, but I, I, I respect that kind of vocabulary. That was one of those handful of times in my life that I think I heard from the Lord in a very direct way because I was just stricken by this idea that those cornerstones were not the celebration of an accomplishment by the Lord or by the campus. Those cornerstones were monuments to my personal insecurity. I wanted to be remembered. And this is the way I was going to be remembered. And once that thought dropped into my mind and my heart, I couldn't shake it off. And I tell you, later that day, I called the general contractor that built all those buildings and said, can you take a cornerstone out of a building? <laughs> 
He said, yeah, you just put some steel in there and pull it out. And, you know, yeah, you can change the cornerstone. I said, okay, I want us to take every one of these two cornerstones on these, what at that time was 11 buildings on our campus that said Paul Kahn president on the corner. I want us to get a bunch of cornerstones that don't have my name on them. Instead, I want them to have this scripture, Psalm 9017. It's a prayer that says, Lord, you make permanent the work of our hands. And that's what we did. Matter of fact, we did it over a weekend. I didn't want to, I didn't want to fiddle and diddle, you know. I don't like to do things slowly. So they got all the cornerstones made. They got their, all their masons together. And when people left work on Friday, went home on the weekend, they all said, Paul Kahn. When they came back on Monday morning, they all said, Psalm 9017. And ever since when we built a building, they say 9017. Because I finally figured out, gummy, that it's not building buildings that secures permanence in your work for God. It's the hand of God. So give it back to God. So every time you walk past one of those cornerstones, that's what Psalm 9017 means. One last one. Psalm 1914. It's our college benediction. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be. Okay. Some translations, and this is one I like to say, be pleasing in your sight. But we use the word acceptable in your sight. I've got another personal story about this, but I don't have time to tell it. <laughs> but one time when I was struggling about leaving Lee, I'd been president 20 years. I was tired and I wanted to do other things with my life. I was 60 years old. I was struggling. Darlie and I were praying and about whether or not to continue. Seemed like a good time to quit. I'd just finished 20 years. We were kind of obsessed with this whole idea, is now the time to quit? We were in Boston. We took a long walk, which we often do. We passed this little Catholic church called St. Mary of the Assumption on Harvard Street going through the little community of Brookline. It was a hot day, and I said, let's just go in and sit down in this church and pray. We'd never been inside this church. We'd passed it many, many times. We went in and sat down in semi-dark. Can God speak to you in a Catholic church? You bet your sweet life he can. He spoke to me that day in a Catholic church. I prayed, sought the Lord. I had no clarity. I got up, kind of motioned to Darlia, who had been sitting in another pew praying in a different place, started to walk out the door. And as I walked out through the lobby, there was a little niche in the lobby with a little alcove in it. And in it was a Bible, and there was a spotlight shining on the Bible. And there was one of these big, lovely, woven bookmarks lying on the Bible to eliminate, eliminate, illuminate one scripture. And I walked over there just to see what that scripture said. And it said, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. And I walked into the sunshine knowing my destiny was at Lee. And in the 14 years after that that I served as president, we had our best years. God blessed us in every conceivable way. And my mind was never troubled again about where I was supposed to be. That's what I hear when I pray this college benediction. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Let's go. Let's go home. All right, listen. You stood there mute during the college benediction. I do it sometimes myself. You've checked your watch during the college benediction, your cell phone. Sometimes you've mumbled the college benediction, but the college benediction is best said with energy, volume, and conviction. Okay? So can we do it that way this time? All right. Let's go. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. God bless you. I love you.